Uh, we've got some really good ones coming up, I think. Uh, December 10th, meaning a month from now, uh, the main presentation will be LaTeX. How many people use LaTeX? You know what it is? L-A-T-E-X. Good, good. LaTeX. Tom, did you have something to say? It's LaTeX. LaTeX. T-E-X or Tech, which is the old typesetting. LaTeX. Will and myself will be working together on that presentation. Uh, I don't think we have a second presentation for that night yet, but we're working on it. Stay tuned. We'll, we'll post it on the mailing list and the website and the meetup page and the Facebook and everywhere we can. Uh, January, we're, we're going back to IPv6. Uh, you guys are, uh, some of you were here for the uh, January 2013 meeting. We had Jim Small come in from CDW. He's an uh, uh, analyst there, a uh, contractor there or something. Anyway, he gave us a great presentation on, on the state of IPv6, uh, where it's at, where it's going, how, how it's working. Uh, he offered to come back again this January to do more of a hands-on kind of thing. I think we're going to set up a, a small network here and, and really see it in action. And I'm really looking forward to that. It was a great presentation last time, and I think it'll be just as good, if not better, this time. Uh, February, uh, tentatively, we've got the Go language. Uh, that's the language that, that I think Google created. And, put out there and lots of people are starting to use it now. Uh, Mark Ram is going to come talk about that. Uh, March 11th, LXC, Linux Containers. Uh, anybody know what, what that is? That's Ooh. kind of a, yeah. kind of, what would you, where would you put that? In virtualization? Or? Yeah, it's a virtualization technique tool, yeah. but it's super awesome. Yeah, Scott Moser is going to come talk about that. It's like all the benefits of a virtualization without all the hardware without, overhead. Yeah, without all the overhead. It's, yeah. it's pretty slick stuff. Uh, and then in April, uh, I mentioned my friend from Facebook who has offered to pay for our ads on Facebook. Uh, he's going to be in town. And uh, he's, uh, he, is, uh, he works in the traffic team for Facebook. He's the tech leader for level four load balancing. I was with him last week, about 10 days ago. And he was explaining to me how the load balancing works at Facebook, and it's just, it's just incredible. And he's going to come give us a great presentation on that. It should be very, very interesting uh, uh, to see how a large company uh, can actually you know, supply services to. Uh, they're up to now like almost 1.1 billion users uh, access the site every month. Uh, at any at any given time, they're feeding like 50 or 60. Second, which you know, <laughs> it's just incredible. Uh, I, th I think they could teach the uh, the, the, the uh, health, the uh, health uh, site uh, a thing or two about how to scale. Anyway, that should be really interesting. Uh, these presentations that I'm talking about, uh, December and January are pretty firm. February, March, and April are, are kind of tentative at this point. They, they may slide around a little bit as people's schedules. That's uh, I mean, we're pretty much booked all the way out to April, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, refreshments, we do have a, a cooler here with uh, with some. Uh, I think there's a couple of waters in there and some pop, and there's some cookies. The deal is, you put a dollar in the jar, you take a, a, a cookie and a pop, or two cookies. I think the cookies are going kind of fast. Uh, don't be shy. Just get up anytime during the meeting if you can do it quietly and uh, grab yourself uh, something to lunch on. Uh, so that takes us right into our first presentation, uh, OpenBSD by Michael Lucas. Uh, Michael's a network engineer, systems administrator, martial artist, and critically acclaimed author. He was on the internet before the web existed, and now works for an independent telecommunications wholesaler in Michigan. Uh, his recent books include Absolute BSD, Second Edition, DNS Sec Mastery, SSH Mastery, Network Flow Analysis, and the forthcoming Pseudo Mastery. I couldn't have done a better introduction if I'd written it myself. Uh, in fact, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I plagiarized it. So. Uh, so not only does he write books, he writes introductions. So uh, I'm, I'm going to turn the stage over to Michael. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Hello, everybody. Hey. This worked two minutes ago. <laughs> you your one chance. Yeah, but nobody was looking then. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. That's pretty quick. So hi, my name is Michael Lucas. Um, 
and he just covered this whole slide, so we're going to skip that. So, this talk is on OpenBSD. Let me start off with, with giving credit where it's due. Uh, the OpenBSD folks put all of their papers that they have ever done at any conference up on their website, which I stole liberally from. Um, and some of the more recent stuff came from Theodoret's uh, keynote a couple months ago. Um, I've written this presentation from scratch, and uh, I'm not entirely sure how long it will take. So I've tried to arrange it so you can tell me to get off the stage at any time. This means you should feel free to ask questions whenever. And typos, there will be some. Why am I here? Jim, if you hate this presentation, please take it out on him. So, OpenBSD. What is it and why should you care? It is yet another free Unix-like operating system. Uh, according to their website, their emphasis is portability, standardization, correctness, proactive security, and integrated cryptography. Uh, BSD, any of the BSDs really, is a complete operating system. Uh, it's not a distribution like you're more familiar with in Linux. Uh, BSD, a BSD operating system is everything. Um, I'm looking around the room, some of you probably uh, were using BSD when it was just plain BSD. Uh, BSD as a project goes back to 1979 and is based on original AT&T Unix. Uh, if anybody's interested in the history from 40 years ago, I can go into that. But Okay, so OpenBSD. What, makes, what do people know about them from the outside? Uh, from talking to people, this seems to be their reputation. They're cranky. They don't support all the hardware you would want. Uh, they focus entirely on security, and they're from Canada. <laughs> and this is what people know. See, the first one and the last one, they contradict each other. <laughs> Um, Canadians are generally some of the friendliest people in the world. Generally, that's an important word. They, they are the exception that proves the rule. At least a, a, according to the reputation. So, that whole, rep, that whole reputation comes from their way of doing things. Uh, their license is, is a, a pure BSD license, or a, a modern BSD license. Uh, they are absolutely fanatical about doing things correctly or not doing them at all. Uh, another thing that's a little different is that OpenBSD is written for the, the people who write it. And they put it up for other people to use. Uh, but they don't really proselytize. They don't try to get people to switch to the OpenBSD way. Um, Linux users are, are frequently a lot more open and uh, friendly and try to suck you in. They convince you that the first hit is free and that once it's on your hard drive you'll never go back. Um, and, and the OpenBSD folks are more like, yeah, here it is, we use it, it works, it would solve your problem, but if, you, if you'd rather have your problem, that's okay with us. Uh, I, I, they're, they're perfectly happy to sit back and uh, see you struggle with whatever problem they've already solved. And, and the other thing is, uh, OpenBSD is something of a pressure point for improving the world. And they, they've done this several times, and um, I'll go through a couple of those. The big difference in, lic in licensing 
Uh, the BSD license, the modern BSD license, yes, it's, it's had a long history, but uh, essentially today the BSD style license comes down to three things. Uh, leave our copyright notice on the code. We wrote this. Don't claim you wrote it. Uh, it's fairly common sense for a lot of us, but uh, some companies have had difficulty with this in the past. Uh, leave the copyright notice in the code. If you ship the code compiled, put it in your documentation somewhere. And if you use this and it breaks, don't blame us. We're, we are not claiming it is suitable for anything. But what this really boils down to, <coughs> uh, there, there are some distinct philosophical differences between BSD licensing and Linux licensing. Um, the GPL, how many of you have read the GPL? Um, I have read it, and I've tried to figure out how it is a software license. <coughs> Uh, it's an interesting political document, but it's not a traditional software license saying what you can and cannot do with it. Uh, that's in there. It's buried in there. But a lot of lawyers make a lot of money trying to figure out what the GPL really is. Um, but really, it's share and share alike, and th that's a great thing. We, we try to teach our kids to share. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, the BSD license code is, is more of a gift. Uh, as a BSD guy, we don't care what you do with the code. You taking BSD code and embedding it in a product and selling it to people doesn't hurt us. We don't care. And essentially, um, I look at it this way. Uh, a lot of people have uh, very strong viewpoints on things like Microsoft took the BSD TCP IP stack and put it in Windows back in the Windows 95 days. Um, yeah, I see a couple blank looks. There was this thing called Windows 95 that didn't have network support. Um, and there was a lot of discussion on, well, this was just awful. They just stole the code. Um, but turn this around. Imagine the cost in human suffering if Microsoft had written their own <laughs> 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 would have failed and we now have <laughs> you, we all had enough pain. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well they wouldn't have connected to the network anyway and everybody would have switched. Yeah. Uh, address Kerberos though. That's the 95 is one example, but the other one is where they took Kerberos. Perverted it. That's that is a whole. Okay, address Kerberos. Um, Microsoft are cretins. No. Oh. Okay, a little more detail. Let's go without saying. <clears throat> uh, Kerberos is an open authentication standard that is also under the BSD license, and they took it, they embraced it, and they extended it so that. You can use Active Directory as an authentication point for Unix systems, but you cannot use Unix systems as an authentication point for Active Directory. Um, yes, imagine that. That is what Microsoft does. Uh, and that played a key role in the antitrust trial, and that's one reason why we now have Samba 4 can act as a domain controller. Uh, and Microsoft paid to have that written. So they actually employ various Samba people to work on Samba and make sure that you can use a Unix host as a Kerberos source. So yes, if a company is going to be a cretin, a software license is not the way to solve that problem. So, OpenBSD was one of the first BSD projects to completely and truly audit 
their source tree and make sure that every single file was under this license. And that this had some interesting implications. How many of you are familiar with VERP? Okay, Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol. Cisco and a bunch of companies sat down and said, you know, our routers are not as reliable as we'd like them to be. It would be really nice if you could have two routers, and if one of them died, the other router would say, oh, I better take over the default gateway IP. Um, this is a uh, not a big revelation to anyone in this room, I'm sure. But they wrote a protocol for it. And the Cisco licensing says, you can implement VERP so long as you don't sue Cisco. From Cisco's point of view, this is very reasonable. Now, here's this protocol. Uh, don't sue us if it breaks. And if I ran a big company, I'd insist on something like that as well. Uh, the OpenBSD code has three license terms. Keep our copyright on the source, keep our copyright on the binaries, and don't sue us. Cisco's extra licensing uh, would have added a fourth term to the operating system. Therefore, that's unacceptable. Therefore, the OpenBSD guys would not include CARP, sorry, would not include VERP in the base operating system. But they wanted a virtual router redundancy protocol-like thing. So they went away and wrote the Common Address Redundancy Protocol, or CARP, and included that. Uh, then they went to the IETF and said, we'd like a protocol number for our redundancy protocol. And the IETF told them, uh, you can't have one because your, your protocol is too much like VERP. And you should just use VERP. So, uh, there were uh, some choices. They could have used a, a local only number, but they chose to use the same protocol number that Cisco used for VERP, <laughs> which is like saying, Port 80 is HTTP, and it's my special protocol. <laughs> uh, the interesting thing was, when you put two car posts on a network with two verb posts, if, say, you have two firewalls next to your two routers so everything can fail over, uh, the Cisco routers crashed and died <laughs> because they saw uh, VERP lacks some fairly basic things, at, at least back in the early 2000s when this was going on. VERP lacked things like authentication and checksumming. So when it saw these weird packets on the wire, the router just fell over. Um, Cisco now programs VERP, at least, a little more defensively. But lots of finger pointing over this, lots of name calling. Uh, there are people on both sides who say this was great, this was awful. Yes, sir? Were these implementing the same protocol or simply two different protocols with the same purpose? Two similar but different protocols with the same purpose. The, the end result of all this, Cisco now supports CARP. Not in all their products, but scattered throughout where a customer has demanded it, they support CARP. So, another big philosophical point. Do it right or don't do it. Um, the people in this room know better. 
it's not always the operating system's fault. Usually, when something goes wrong, there's an application that went haywire. Somebody did something they shouldn't do. But the truth is, no, it's the operating system's fault. Uh, you blame Linux, you blame Windows, you blame whatever. So, the OpenBSD guys say, no, no, it is our fault. If you, have a, if you somehow crash the operating system, it's our fault. If your program goes amok, it should not take down the machine. But this has a couple of impacts on how they do things. <laughs> Blobs. Uh, binary objects. Vendors provide dri device drivers as these binary objects for Microsoft operating systems. How many of you have a Linux desktop or laptop with some driver provided by the operating system vendor? Okay. This code is running in the kernel. The kernel doesn't have a huge amount of internal protection against other parts of the kernel. This means this driver really could do anything. It could corrupt the file system. It could send all of your keystrokes to the NSA. Um, it, anything. So the OpenBSD guy said, no, no binary only drivers. We do not support them. Uh, there is a mechanism for loading dynamic objects into the kernel, uh, but you have to go through a couple steps to enable it, and they're pretty much labeled shoot foot here. <laughs> so, non-disclosure agreements are kind of similar. Someone gets an NDA, they write a driver, send it off in the tree, but who's supposed to check that driver? Who's supposed to make sure that driver actually works the way you think it does? I mean, how many of you have written code that you looked at later and said, I don't know why this works. It, it really shouldn't. Now, I, I'm, a, I'm a very weak programmer. I, I do shell and Perl. And I have looked at Perl scripts six months later and, and said, was I stoned? Now, how, how did this ever achieve the result it gets? So, non-disclosure agreement means it's very hard to audit that code and check it for stupidity versus, no, this is really what the driver needs. Because uh, the hardware vendors have the exact same problem. Uh, sometimes they're not sure how their hardware works at all. So, the target users. And it's this is probably the easiest thing to, to explain. It's written for themselves. They add features because they need them. Uh, they wrote the CARP redundancy protocol because a couple guys were using OpenBSD as firewalls and said, hey, we need failover. We're running on 386 hardware and this stuff is crap. Um, it, they provide everything you need to actually use the operating system. Uh, there is full documentation on the actual system. If this doesn't work for you, there are lots of people who are really trying to suck you in as users. Um, everyone from Apple to FreeBSD to Linux wants you. Um, they want you. They're just not really willing to do any effort to get you to switch. Because if they need to expend the effort, well, they'd rather be writing code. Um, and if you want a new feature, here's the system source code. Send us a patch. So, you can, you can use OpenBSD for anything you like. Um, you can even use it as a model for suing Cisco. 
Um, chances are that lawsuit is not going to work, but um, you can bury it in your product, whatever you want. We don't care. Many people have taken OpenBSD or some other BSD system and used it to create an embedded device. And if you go looking around the world, people from EMC down to uh, home router manufacturers are using some BSD, OpenBSD, something as the heart of their system. So, I have a, I have a room full of Linux fans. If you were to go get an OpenBSD CD, plug it in and spin it up, what would you expect? And I messed up the slide order. Yes. <laughs> Could I have a, a, is there some person who'd like to volunteer for a moment? <laughs> Sir, come here. Um, you're like in good health and everything. Yeah, no, no major injuries, I should be aware of that. Okay. Um, do me a favor and hold up your hands. See, a pressure point is something, it's a term we use in martial arts, where you can, if you're holding someone the right way, you can make them move around and really do whatever you want. <laughs> Basically steer them however you wish or Okay? Yeah, okay. So, if this was the body of internet software, OpenBSD is like that. Thank you, sir. Yes, OpenBSD is a pressure point. So, what that really means is, you know, computer research is pretty much dead. Um, how many of you have seen Microsoft actually stop supporting an API? Say, no, we no longer let you do that. Your old software doesn't work. No, it oh. does not happen. Well, XP. XP. No, no, no. No, <laughs> XP as an operating system is no longer supported, but the APIs that you use to write code. My copy of uh, Office 97 still runs on Windows 7. Does Desview X run? Does Desview? Haven't tried. <laughs> uh, my gut answer is yes. So, but there are all these good ideas for improving security, for an improving operating systems as a whole. But as long as the old stuff still works the way it used to, nothing really changes. So, how does this tie back to pressure points? We've known for 20 years it would be a really good idea if memory was not allocated in strict stack order. If you were to shuffle things around, uh, you would eliminate entire classes of not just security vulnerabilities, but problems. Buffer overflows would be much harder to do. The compiler support was there, uh, but nobody really wanted to pick up on it because, once again, we don't know why our code works. <laughs> and there is code out there that at one point depended on actually having internal buffer overflows <laughs> so that you know, some other part of the process could pick that out. And there was code out there that was just written wrong but seemed to work. And if it crashed every now and then, well, file a bug report. So, the compilers knew how to randomize memory. Um, but nobody wanted to turn it on because all of this third-party software just fell over and died. <clears throat> And, and it died a horrible, unpredictable deaths. Um, even simple things like uh, WRX, marking a piece of memory as either writable 
by a process or executable by a process. We, uh, programs are divided between the executable code and the memory of the stuff that it's actually trying to work on. And a program should never overwrite its own executable code in memory. Uh, at least not the majority of software. There, there are exceptions. Okay. Now, there are people who are doing really clever things and... There are exceptions and exception handlers. Yes, there's always an exception. So, OpenBSD said, you know, this is the right thing to do. We're going to break a whole bunch of third-party software went through their own tree, made sure everything worked with memory randomization, uh, did a fresh release, and then turned it on globally. So they had, uh, I believe it was 3.2, no memory randomization, 3.2 plus one day, memory randomization. And they had a whole release cycle. Um, And did I? So, what happened? If they had some kind of memory allocation bug, it broke. Um, OpenBSD has enough users. If, if you are the maintainer of a software project, uh, I'm going to pick on Emacs here because I actually use it. <laughs> um, and yeah, Emacs is a wonderful operating system. Yeah. Uh, if you maintain something like Emacs and you get a bug report that says, I turned on memory randomization in my operating system and Emacs totally crapped out, you're going to go, you're an idiot. Don't turn this on. Everybody knows everything breaks. If you get 300 bug reports that say, Emacs no longer runs on OpenBSD. Here is my bug report. We'll take another look at it. Um, and yes, it's the same root cause. Uh, the code was crap as far as buffer overflows and memory leaks and, and all of that. But the end result was it compelled people Software authors were kind of picked up by this fragile little pressure point and dragged around until they fixed their code. And the result of this was, no matter what operating system you're running, you have a lot fewer of that class of problems. So, you're running Linux, you're running Emacs on Linux, you have many fewer bugs because of this. This dragged the world forward, whether it liked it or not. And as someone who was on the mailing list at the time, they liked it not. Uh, and then, once the OpenBSD guys and their users filed all these bug reports and got everything fixed. Over the next couple years, lots of other operating systems took the same plunge and turned on their memory address randomization. Uh, most Linux kernels either ship with this now or it's a syscatel you just turn on and off. So. What are some other things security related OpenBSD has done? Uh, OpenSSH, how many of you use OpenSSH? I'm going to assume the people who have not raised their hands are not paying attention. Uh, so how would I know? Do you use SSH on Linux? How would I know? Do you type SSH? No. Ah. Uh, Putty? <laughs> Not often. <off. laughs> when you use Putty, you're probably touching OpenSSH. Mm -hmm. um, privilege separation, we'll touch on what that is. New APIs like Strl Copy and Strl Cat. Stack protection, 
uh, Profilis, which is the memory randomization. Uh, Spark hardware has this stack ghost feature, which is another memory protection mechanism. Writable or executable memory, randomized everything. So, let's fall back and look at the reputation. Limited device driver support. No blobs. If your vendor will not give the documentation to write a device driver that can be audited by other people, sorry, uh, they're not going to let you load, well, they will let you load random objects into the kernel, but you're going to have to do the work yourself. They're, they're not going to encourage this or help it. It's all about security. Sort of, it's, it's about correctness, it's about doing it right, and security is a consequence of that. Cranky. OpenBSD won't support my video card! Shut up. <laughs> uh, and you know that after they've answered that question after 50 or 100 times, people start to get a little cranky. So, Canadian, yeah. guilty. So, part of the reputation, is, oh, no, wait, uh, yeah, they have developers all over the world. Never mind. So, that, that's how OpenBSD does things. Okay. Um, So what's in OpenBSD now? I'm going to touch on a couple notable things. Uh, Unix-like operating system, it'll be fairly familiar to everyone in this room. Uh, the remarkable thing for a, uh, that you would find coming from Linux is all the documentation you need is on the operating system. You can troubleshoot OpenBSD without Google. Everything is in the manual or in the FAQ. So, if you were to try it, what would really be a surprise? Uh, the installer is text mode. Again, it's written for the developers. Text mode is much faster than a pointy, clicky, friendly GUI because you can, uh, I've tried it before, you can hit eight keys and install OpenBSD. And most of those keys are either enter or Y. Um, there, there is no official OpenBSD forum. I know that's all the trend these days, but no, no. There's a mailing list. Uh, and interfaces are not named ETH0. Uh, they'll have names like FXP0 after the uh, driver for the network card. <clears throat> Another thing that uh, a lot of Linux users find surprising is partitioning. Uh, many Linux systems have one or two large partitions. Maybe they have slash and slash home to separate the OS from user files. Uh, something like Ubuntu, you just have a single large partition. OpenBSD actually divides the system uh, pretty narrowly for a lot of things. But they also use mount options to protect uh, the system and the user from various sorts of attacks. For example, you should not have device nodes anywhere except on slash dev. You, you, there's very little reason to do that. If you need them, you can turn it on easily enough. Uh, set UID programs in slash temp are usually a bad sign. So, uh, they use the partitioning to protect the system and the user. Okay, privilege separation. How many of you have worked with that at all? Okay, 
On a Unix-like system, to bind to a low-numbered port, port 1024 or below, you need root privilege. This means that if you have a program bound to a low number port, like 80 or 22 for SSH or your website or Telnet or anything like that, it's running as root. So if someone can compromise that particular daemon, they've rooted your system. A lot of people write daemons for services that want to run on a privileged port. So uh, the guys at Postfix said, you know, we're going to write a really small program. And the only thing this program is going to do is bind to port 25. And then for all of the actual stuff that the program is supposed to do, we're going to feed it to unprivileged programs running as a, a very narrowly constrained user. So, you know, if the program you have listening to your privileged port is 20 lines of heavily audited code, it's really, really hard to compromise. Uh, it's much harder to compromise than the tens of thousands of lines of code you, you have for handling your mail or your web server. So uh, the OpenBSD guy said, you know, that's a really good idea. We're going to steal it. And use privilege separation on OpenSSH. And now anything that attaches to the network runs with privilege separation. Ping. They have no idea how someone could use ping to compromise a system. But they don't really care. We're going to run this little part as root because it needs to run as root. And the, the rest of the process just runs as an unprivileged user. <coughs> if somebody ever does discover how to use ping to root a system, it probably won't run on OpenBSD. And even the X window system has privilege separation. Um, OpenSSH, I wanted to touch on a little bit more uh, because this is the secure shell <laughs> server for over 90% of the market. Uh, SSH was around in the late 90s. Early versions were under a BSD style license. And when SSH went commercial, they changed the license. Uh, a couple people noticed that SSH 1.2.12 was under the, the last version under a BSD license and said, you know, I bet we could take that code and bring it up to modern standards. And they did a huge amount of work on that. Uh, they did a good enough job that they actually uh, had to fend off trademark complaints from commercial SSH. Uh, and new features in SSH actually hit OpenBSD first, and then a couple other people extract OpenSSH uh, from OpenBSD. They put some portability glue around it, and they release the SSH that you have on Linux and Solaris and everywhere else. Um, for the record, the OpenBSD guys would really, really like to see a good competing SSH implementation. Because it is not good for any one piece of software to have 90% market share. Um, so if you're looking for a, pro a project to really make yourself known at, take this on. So OpenBSD is also highly portable. Um, how many of you have a VAX in your basement? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, it runs on OpenB OpenBSD runs on it. How many of you don't know what a VAX is? Okay, computer from the 1980s, uh, used at a lot of universities. Yeah, DEC made them. Uh, DEC bought whoever it was that made VAX, I believe. But, uh, 
You know, I forget anymore. I, I haven't. PDP 8, then PDP 11, and the VAC superseded it. VAC, Thank VAC, you, sir. What? VAC sort of cracked the market because before then, everybody who came out with a new, every company that came out with a new, faster computer wrote a new operating system for it. VAC right. was, I believe, the first one to use the same operating system across a wide, wide range of, uh, of hardware. Well, that, VAX was very good hardware. Some of it still runs today. Why is this important? Well, one, <coughs> porting to multiple platforms makes sure that your code is portable. And two, a lot of people do their development on a nice, fast AMD64 machine. If they make a change that adds a tiny bit of overhead, uh, you're not going to notice it on the AMD 64 machine. But the guys who are running VAX will go, uh, excuse me, <laughs> guys, you just host performance. So all of this, things like network stack randomization, they work on a VAX. This, there, there's, there is overhead. But it runs on hardware from 1970-something, 1980-something, and that hardware is usable, so shut up. And another thing that's interesting is they never cross-compile. A lot of people who support multiple hardware platforms will, they actually build the code on a 24-core you know, AMD64 machine and install it on the Max. No. Their releases are actually, their VAX release is built on a VAX because this is a validation that the code actually works, that the operating system is self hosting. Azorus? That Sorry. previous slide, the Sharp Azorus? Azorus, yes. Tiny little device. For a long time, it was the, the only way to get handheld SSH. You could, uh, uh, it had a thumb-based keyboard. Right. I, I had two. Oh, you, oh, you have two. You can run OpenBSD on it, and people use them today. So, uh, you can customize OpenBSD. They have, they have thousands of add-on software packages. Most of it is compiled with the most common options. You want to set up an Apache PHP server, yeah, fine. <coughs> if you want something kind of exotic, you know, you want Emacs built with the Athena toolkit. Mm -hmm. uh, they make it very easy to build it yourself, but they're not going to bother to build it. One of the nice things about OpenBSD is the PF packet filter. Um, how many of you have used IP tables? I have used IP tables. Um, I've used it a great deal, and therefore I feel quite confident in saying that I really hate it. This is a configuration file for PF. Don't allow anything in. Pass in on our network interface from anything on the local network. Pass in from anywhere else on these three ports and send anything out. You can look at this and, and even not knowing much about PF, you can have a pretty good idea what this rule set does. It is last match. Uh, how and that is a... Does the packet filter also do things like masquerading and transfer? Oh, yes. Yes, you have masquerading. It does bandwidth control. Um, everything you need to build a, a very solid network mingling device. Um, you can also do much more complex things. Define a table of the hosts that uh, you want to treat specially. 
set up macros for various things in your rule set. So you don't want to, uh, if your external interface is VR0, you don't want to change your network card and have to go do a search and replace on your firewall rule set because something's going to go wrong. Uh, especially if your interfaces are named something like 80 colon something. Uh, search and replace goes very wrong very quickly. So you can define which interfaces you want to treat in which way. You can define which addresses, which ports. So uh, instead of having a bunch of rules that say from each of these addresses, you can see our second line there that just says pass in from our management hosts. You get a new subnet that, that will have that has something important on it. You add it to one list of addresses and it percolates through the entire rules. Uh, the, the equivalent in IP tables is a little longer and at least in my opinion harder to read. This resembles English. So you can alter those tables at the command line. You can add dynamic rules at a command line if you want. Uh, the trick is you define a place in the rules that says here is an anchor, a named label, where you may add rules. So instead of just you know, running a command line and tagging it wherever you want, the filter says no. You may add rules here and here. And this retains your uh, strict processing of your firewall rules. So some other things, uh, all the hardware sensors, uh, all of that IPMI related stuff works, uh, spills its guts out for you. Tmux lets you run multiple windows in one window. It's much like screen except, uh, how many of you have used the screen? Well, screen includes features like uh, a serial line client, which I'm, I'm sure there was a perfectly good reason for it, but these kinds of features make screen much larger and much more complicated. Tmux is just a terminal multiplexer. Uh, the CWM window manager I think is wonderful. Uh, the swap, how many of you have, have run into the encrypted swap problem? If you encrypt your entire swap space so that nobody can read it, but you use one key, for the entire space, anything written to swap can stay there for years. Depending on how your program is written, this may include your passwords. So OpenBSD doesn't have one giant swap space that it encrypts. It has one swap space with a whole bunch of tiny encrypted swaps, each with its own key. And when it's done with a piece of swap, it throws away the key for that piece. Uh, all kinds of fun routing stuff. And of course, clothing. Um, you may have seen a lot of OpenBSD clothing around conferences and such. And there's actually a pretty good reason for that. Uh, OpenBSD has no corporate backer. All of their development is funded entirely by sale of CD sets. Uh, T-shirts, related stuff. Um, you can buy two of my books through the OpenBSD project and the proceeds go to them. And of course, uh, they take donations. They will happily take your money. So, it is a quarter to eight. I have till what? Uh, Eight-ish is okay? Okay. I'm going to try to go through this. This is the current OpenBSD memory randomization project. The 2038 issue. How many of you hope to be retired by 2038? Okay, 
this has a huge impact on you. Um, because of system lifespans, the, the electrical controls in Detroit are 40 years old, which is sadly not that uncommon. Um, Toronto is not far from here, and, and their uh, can-do nuclear plant, lovely name. It's run by a PD, was run by a PDP-11 for many years. It finally died. They replaced it with a modern PC running a PDP-11. <laughs> Heavy later. <laughs> this is what, 200 miles from here? The wind fortunately goes. Yeah, fortunately the wind usually blows that <laughs> Um But we have nuclear reactors west of here. Um, what about medical devices? Wind River sells Linux for medical devices. I would not be shocked to discover in the year 2038 that I had a pacemaker. And I do not want it to have 32-bit time, thank you. <laughs> well, am I going to get a call in, you know, uh, late December 2037 saying, uh, we need you to come in for an operation now. No, no. You're on a waiting list. You're, you're on a waiting list. Yeah, but just come to the waiting room and, you know, first come, first serve to have your BIOS flash. <laughs> um, at that point, you know, I would just about have a heart attack, except, of course, of course I couldn't. <laughs> So, um, there are solutions. They've invented a, a time 64T, but nobody uses it. And adding this new API won't fix all the old code. Um, it's the same, you know, Microsoft never su stopped supporting old APIs. Uh, Linux has the overwhelming majority of old APIs. I know they've pulled a few, but for the most part, old code actually works. And there are other things, there are games you can play with signed versus unsigned. Um, that all gets really ugly really fast and lots of stuff will break. And if you're going to break it anyway, let's break it properly. We could say, okay, world, the world will be on 64-bit hardware by then. Um, and the answer is no. Embedded manufacturers are not going to switch to 64-bit hardware until 32-bit is no longer made. The power requirements are much higher. System requirements much higher, much more heat. And 32-bit hardware will continue to be made until embedded manufacturers stop buying it. Okay. We could say, yes, there is a forward migration path. Anyone remember large, the Large File Summit? Um, they wanted, back in 92, all the Unix guys got together and said, we need to support fire files larger than two gigabytes. Here's our forward migration path. <coughs> and this will support files up to 128 gigs. And eventually people will stop doing, everybody will have migrated forward, and you will no longer need to define dash D large file source. Compile some software sometime. Look at what scrolls past. And you will to this day see a majority of software saying define this flag. That Forward migration isn't. If you have a bright idea on solving the 2038 issue, try it, document it. Present it at a conference. Save us all, please. <laughs> OpenBSD is going, is redefining time T as long, long. This will end this problem.
it will no longer be an issue during the life of our universe. Anyone who wants to port OpenBSD into the next universe, uh, I suggest you reset the epoch and don't worry about backwards compatibility. <laughs> so, they've done this on all the platforms. Stuff is breaking. It's kind of cool. Um, bug reports are being filed because in theory, in theory, the software should just take it and compile, and we all know that it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> people are reporting bugs, but OpenBSD will ship with long, long time T. And they are using their position as a pressure point to drag everybody else forward with them. Now, people have tried things like this before. FreeBSD and Linux have long time T on 64 bit hardware. NetBSD went to long, long time T everywhere, but they didn't do any work on engaging the outside world that things are crashing. And sadly, that's. You know, the open BS, sorry, the net BSD folks are not that involved in the outside world. So what's the difference between long time and long, long time? It varies by platform. Long, long does also? Or? I believe so. There are probably people here capable of giving a much better answer than I can. But a 32 bit CPU, long, long would be 64 bit? Yes. Typically, long, long, um, 128 bit in places? In places. There is. Uh, like a U64, there's a, a several different types of other defines I have to deal with embedded because I have to port between 60 and 32 bit, whatever. Sure. Short, long, 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 whatever is different everywhere. Um, as, as bad as when the Linux had to go to the alpha where the pointers were 64 bits and the integers were not. Um, but the idea is there's usually a portability library. And everybody does it a little bit differently, but if you need a bit size, I, there's a particular include. I don't remember what it is, but I think it's probably like U32, U64, U16, or whatever. And then that type defs it to either long, 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 short, or unsigned car as whatever. Cars are not necessarily 8 bits either. But. <laughs> That's another thing. But um, the, there's, when I say long, long, or long time T, well, time T is the type def thing that should be 64 bits. Time T will now, be, in 5.5, will now be. Um, Type def to a unsigned 64-bit integer by what whatever include magic for the architecture that you don't want to see. So it's not whether it's long, long or whatever. It, it, the time t's type def was 32-bit unsigned 32-bit. Now it's going to be unsigned 64-bit. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I knew I didn't have to prepare that. Someone would <laughs> fill in for me. So, yes, sir. Will that compile on Azorus? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it will. It will, will it? compile everywhere. And will it run fast? It will actually. I can guarantee you that the Vax users will be checking. <laughs> so, by doing this, OpenBSD is. Yes, they're leaning on third parties, but they're also saying, hey, here's our code. Here are all kinds of ways to fix this in your code. And it will drag the world forward whether it likes it or not. Yes, sir. So it seems like, well, OK, you guys will probably, OpenVS may never be the world's most popular open source yep. operating system. But given, but it seems like one real value would have is that if I'm a software vendor and I can say my software compiles and runs on OpenBSD, then no matter what pro, no matter what um, platform you do run on, there are whole classes of programs that we can kind of promise you you will not have. Yes. And that could be very valuable to a lot. Yes. If you run on OpenBSD and you run correctly, that is an acid test to say. We do not have these classes of problems. Uh, 
How many BSDs are there? You mentioned yes. open, free, <laughs> and, um, Okay, the, the big BSDs, I'm going to answer that in just a second because this is the last slide. Okay. OpenBSD.org, go there, try it out. Um, I have books there, here, you can buy some of them. There, uh, this trip, the gas is now tax deductible. Um, how many BSDs are there? How much time have we got? 755, okay. Uh, there are four major BSDs. Uh, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, and then Dragonfly, which is a... Uh, Uh, FreeBSD is focused on the most popular hardware, OpenBSD, uh, and all the stuff I just babbled about. NetBSD's main goal is portability. Dragonfly it has some radical reimaginings of the operating system, and their end goal is to run as a single system image across multiple pieces of commodity hardware. Is it ready yet? No, it is not ready yet. However, their, uh, their multiprocessor support now runs completely lockless, which is a, a major stepping stone towards that. I don't know if they'll succeed, but it's really kind of cool to watch, and I'm, I'm glad someone's being really ambitious. What would be the advantage of that? You have a room full of 100 PCs, and they have one operating, operating system instance. They're all running, all of the cores on all of those machines are coordinated as one operating system. It's like what Google does, um, except they use a, an array of Linux systems, and their software is written to cooperate between OSs. Um, the Dragonfly goal is you SSH into one machine, and you're actually administering all of them because the same OS instance is running on all of the nodes. You call a pointer. In your code, it might be on that node, or on that node, or on that node. One memory space. Who cut a node? Do all you BSD guys <coughs> get along? Do you play together well? Yes, and no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like football. If you get a bunch of if you get a bunch of football fans in the same room, you know, someone says, "Well, I'm a Packers fan, and the Packers are awesome." And someone else will say, I'm going to take oh, no. you out back. No. Sorry? So I'm going to take you out back? <laughs> Perhaps. And someone will say, no, Steelers all the way. And someone holds up a hand and says, Detroit Lions. And everybody goes, ha, ha, ha. Um, but uh, among the people who are really in the communities, yeah, they get along. I mean, at least we're not golf. Hockey. <laughs> Oh, oh, hey, d don't go dissing hockey. <laughs> I would, uh, it's quite the opposite. Oh, but speaking of which, OS X uh, Darwin... Uh... Oh, yes. OS X is... Uh, the user land is BSD-based. Yeah, what is the relative size of, of these? Uh, is one 90% and the other is smaller? Uh, FreeBSD has the largest user base because they actually try to recruit people. They, they do things like promotion. Um, OpenBSD is second. There, there is a certain charm in moral absolutes. Say, no, we will you know, stick two fingers in Cisco's eyes because it is the right thing to do. And that's, you know, they're kind of like, OpenBSD is like the Richard Stallman of the BSD world. That's, this is how you do it. This is the right way. This is the right way, and if you don't like it, go go play with Windows or something. 
Just, mm -hmm. but you get them, you go to a conference with a heavy BSD contingent. Go to the nearest bar with a decent selection, and you will find them there buying each other drinks and debating the fine points of this or that type of architecture. And how much commonality is there in the code? Uh, we steal from each other blatantly and liberally. A <laughs> uh, code <coughs> may originate in one project, migrate to another, be improved in a third, and stolen back to the original. We're, it's all under the same license. We. We really have no, I don't want to say pride of ownership, there, there's, if someone has a good idea, we'll take it. Why don't you choose one over the other one? What are your goals? Yeah. Security. If, if you're looking for what OpenBSD offers, I use FreeBSD and OpenBSD. Each has a, a, a separate place. And to be honest, each has its own annoying peculiarities. Um, the OpenBSD I'll use mostly for uh, packet filter routing. Um, I'll also use it for a highly secure system like uh, my Ansible system runs OpenBSD. Uh, because that is a, a key point for systems administration. Ansible is like Puppet or Chef. I, I don't want anyone getting into that. It's OpenBSD. If I want to run a whole bunch of you know, Apache modules and such, and just make it pretty easy, I'll use FreeBSD. Yeah, what about the Linux utilities? Well, Linux, not Linux, the utilities that would be things like uh, move and copy. Uh, it's They're not GNU Linux. No, they're not. And is it possible to get the GNU utility? Oh, yes. Um, there is a core utils port. And there is even a script that will do a bunch of aliases for you and say, here, put this in your .cshrc or .shrc. Um, the the, mo the thing I find most annoying switching from one to the other are the flags to PS. <laughs> because back when POSIX was first defined, a lot of us were saying, hallelujah. Someone will finally have to sit down and say, is it PS minus AX or PS minus EAF? I don't care which, just pick one. <laughs> and the standard came out and said, you may use either. <laughs> and to which various of us got on our, por our porches and our pitchforks, but it was too late. Um, but yes, you can certainly get the, the core GNU utils. Uh, you, you said you use Emacs. Yeah, I use Emacs. Emacs are good. Yeah. Uh, does that come with the operating system? Or do you build that is an add-on package. I do package add Emacs. Actually, it's usually package add Emacs no X because I I don't want the X, and that's a very common config, so they support it. One point you said this is Unix like. So, so what's the, what's the, the difference here between Unix and Unix-like? Because I would have thought that this is actually that, oh, Unix. And there's actually a very easy answer. The word Unix is a trademark of the open group. To call your operating system Unix, you must submit to the, their compatibility tests and fork out large amounts of money. Which means that any operating system that lets you build it from scratch and you can tweak whatever you want is going to have a hard time qualifying for that. And also, you'd have to do it for every single release, every single point release, every security update. 
and nobody bothers. Nobody cares anymore. Uh, Sun cared. They paid the money. They are real Unix. Um, and do you remember the, the AT&T lawsuits? It all ties back to that. So as an author, I have learned to be very careful. It's Unix-like. However, what did BSD stand for originally? Berkeley Software Distribution. Back in the day, yes, uh, back in the day, AT and T let universities use Unix for, for a small fee to cover the cost of the tape to deliver it, and uh, it was missing a lot of features. And computer science teachers have these students who need projects. So they would assign projects to their class like um, you know, the S51K file system sucks diseased moose way. <laughs> Write a better file system. And the students would write this code and they would submit it. Uh, the University of California Berkeley acted as a clearinghouse for all these contributions. And they eventually found out that they had rewritten the entirety of AT&T Unix, except for a small handful of files. So one day, Bill Joy sat down and rewrote those files, and here we are. So nobody was actually using AT&T Unix for several years. They were all running AT&T plus BSD patch set. Any other questions? I think I'm trampling into Mm -hmm. I'm really trampled into my next speaker's time. I'm very sorry, sir. Um, I guess I'm going to dinner if you have questions. But yes, yes. Oh.